So today I want to spend some time talking about uh, the letter from Paul to the Philippians and the time that Paul spent uh, in Philippi in Acts. And you know what, I want to make sure, uh, Bill, can you just do me a favor and chime in and tell me if you can see my, my screen? I'm having some minor technical difficulties here. And if I have to do this without the slides, we can do that. But if I can get like a confirmation of we some kind. We can see it, Kyle. You can? Yes. Okay, thank you. So, you know, I was gonna say that uh, I, I, feel, I feel a little bit like a set of bookends today. Um, it was about two months ago that I sat here at the beginning of our uh, church from home phase of the pandemic uh, with the first message uh, via Zoom. And, and now here, here I am, hopefully, hopefully here we are at the end of this. And this is the, the last message that will be brought uh, via Zoom. And, um, you know, I was going to say something about being old pros at Zoom, but it seems I'm st still struggling with it in a little bit. Uh, so, but I'm, I'm grateful, um, I'm grateful for the way that we've managed through this time. I'm grateful for the way that we have stayed connected, that we've uh, continued to encourage one another, that, that we've really, that we've shown that the, the church is, is more than a, it's more than a building. It's not a building at all. Um, that the gospel is, is still going out that we are still supporting uh, missionaries near and far, um, even, even all through the, the events of these last few months. And, and now we get to rejoice as, um, as things are beginning to get back to normal. Um, businesses are, are opening up again. Um, you can eat at restaurants outside. Um, Maybe I'll, maybe I'll get a haircut this week. Who knows? Um, and Lord willing, we're going to be back uh, together at our, at, our, at our building next Sunday. And I am looking forward to that. There is much to rejoice about, um, even as we stay vigilant and work to prevent uh, a second wave. Um, so I want to start with a, with a story this morning. Uh, 400 years ago, there was a ship that dropped anchor in a natural harbor um, off the coast of Cape Cod. And it was hundreds of miles from its intended destination. There were about 135 men, women, and children on board, including the crew. Um, and they were not united in how they would proceed and what they would do when they uh, disembarked and got back onto land. They had just spent two months at sea, which is two months isolated from the rest of the world. Um, somehow I feel there's some parallel there with the time that we've spent in this, under some form of stay at home order. They had experienced food and supply shortages. Um, I'm sure that our shortages of toilet paper and other supplies had, had nothing on what they experienced. There had been disease aboard the ship, just as we are experiencing now. And I guarantee you that they were sick and tired of living the way that they were on that ship. And they were ready to get back to normal. I'm sure some of that sounds familiar, uh, but the ship in this story is the, is the Mayflower. And its passengers were the people that we know as pilgrims. And they, like us, found themselves anchored on the precipice of a new phase in their lives, even on the precipice of the new world. And they, like us, were going to have to decide how they were going to handle their new circumstances and how they were going to govern themselves. And so I want to, I want to ask you to, to see this morning uh, that we're at anchor right now. And that like the pilgrims, we're all tired of living the way that we have these last few months. 
I know, I know that I am. We're all ready to get on with our lives. But before we step off of, off of the ship, so to speak, before we send out the expeditionary party to begin building the colony, we have an opportunity to decide who we're going to be, how we're going to self-govern, and what kind of new normal we're going to establish in this new world. So let's pray, and then uh, we're going to read, um, starting in Philippians, starting at the end of chapter 3. Our Father in heaven, um, we come before you uh, humbled, humbled by, um, by your power and by our, um, our comparative weakness. Um, you tell us not to be anxious because who of us by being anxious could add even one, one day to his life? Um, we trust in you. Uh, we put all of our faith in you. We stand on, uh, on your promises and, and not on anything that, uh, that man can provide. We look to you today to, um, to guide us, to help us make wise decisions, to, to be united in this time. Um, Lord, that we would that we would just put our trust um, in you for our lives and for our hope uh, and for, for our eternal salvation. Uh, I pray that you, would, that you would guide me this morning, um, that I would share the message that you, uh, that you would have shared with your people uh, and that it would be an encouragement to all of us um, as we look forward to being back together uh, face to face. And may that remind us that we are still looking forward to the day that we are face-to-face uh, -face with you uh, at last and forever. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So Philippians uh, chapter 3, starting with verse 20. Paul wrote, But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the power, who, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body, by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my, my beloved. Rejoice. In the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. So, as you know, this is our last message um, in our series on Paul's letter to the Philippians. And personally, I'm, uh, I'm, not, I'm not ready for, for it to be over. I've really enjoyed this series and I've really... Uh, enjoyed hearing from uh, from all the other guys, uh, and I appreciate um, your efforts and your preparation and, and the encouragement that it's been to me. Uh, but this passage, um, this sort of hinge passage between the end of Philippians 3 and the beginning of Philippians 4 is just incredible to me. Um, Paul talks about the Philippians as citizens of, of heaven or a colony of heaven on earth. And there's a command to rejoice. We don't typically think of uh, as a command and, and a call to be, to be reasonable, to let our reasonableness be made known. And I, I want to take some time today to look at how all of this is connected. It's all one thought. I think sometimes we, there are some verses, there are some verses in here that we, as, as believers, uh, memorize as one-offs, and, and they, can come, they can come to feel like one-offs or one-liners, and they're, they're not. Um, everything from, from being citizens of heaven all the way through to 
to rejoicing and to being reasonable is one uh, honestly revolutionary um, and, and even subversive thought. Uh, and it is just as meaningful and powerful and dangerous today as it was 2000 years ago. But before we dive further into that, I, I want to come back to the pilgrims still anchored off the coast of the new world. They're not all united as one happy band of colonists. There's division among them on the ship, just as there was division among the Philippians and as is still all too common today, um, which I, I know we have all seen now played out in our own society in the last, not just the last week, but especially in this last week. Um, but for a colony, division is, is deadly. Colonies cannot survive division. They face terrible odds anyway. Um, and they, they have to be united if they're going to stand any chance at all they're going to have any hope at all. And that, that applies to the Philippians, that applies to the pilgrims on the Mayflower, and it applies to us this morning. So I wanna look a little bit at how, uh, how the pilgrims solved for this. How would they go about developing unity and establishing their colony? Um, what they did was write a covenant they drew up a contract by which they, the signers, would agree to govern themselves. And so this is what they wrote, still anchored off the coast of Cape Cod in what's come to be known as the Mayflower Compact. It reads like this, in the name of God, amen. We whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign Lord, King James, by the grace of God of England, France, and Ireland, King, Defender of the Faith. Having undertaken for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith and the honor of our King and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, do by these presents, solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and of one another, covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid, and by virtue hereof to enact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and offices from time to time, as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony, unto which we promise all due submission and obedience. In witness whereof, we have hereunto subscribed our names at Cape Cod, the 11th of November, in the reign of our sovereign Lord, King James of England, France, and Ireland, the 18th, and of Scotland, the 45th, Anno Domini, 1620. At the bottom of this document, 41, um, 41 signers, 41 men signed their names uh, they were all of the, at the time, what would have been considered to be the eligible signers um, of this document. Every, everyone on that ship who was eligible signed. And so that's, that, that was their, their framework for establishing their colony. So what about us and what, and what about the Philippians? Aren't, aren't we all in need of some kind of plan as little colonies of heaven on earth, struggling to stay united and to stay together and standing firm in the current of the culture around them. This is what Paul was writing into. And I know I've already said it, but the end of Paul's letter to the Philippians is a call to a, to a quiet and peaceful revolution, but one that one that I hadn't recognized entirely before, um, and one that I think we haven't fully uh, embraced as a people, even to this day. Uh, so I wanna, I wanna spend some time looking at that. So let's take a look at what he said um, 
again, a closer look. Let's start with the first verse in chapter four. It reads, therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. So I want to notice, I want all of us to notice that this is a a hinge verse. Uh, It connects what came before it with what comes after it by the use of both uh, therefore to point backwards and thus to point forwards. And what Paul is doing is connecting everything that he's told the Philippians about the what of their new reality, their citizenship in heaven, their need to be of the same mind as Christ, their mission to shine as lights in the world with the how of their new reality that he's going to explain soon with commands to rejoice. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice and to be reasonable. He says, let your reasonableness be made known to all men and to remember that the Lord is at hand. And I just want to notice also the care that Paul takes in challenging his uh, Philippian brothers and sisters to these ideals. Six times in this verse, he shows them affection in some way. He longs for them. They're his brothers. He loves them. They're his joy and his crown, and they're his beloved. He's not going to challenge them without, without loving them. And he's not going to challenge them without adhering to his own principles, which is what I, uh, I, w- I want to look at in a little bit. He rejoices with them. He's going to reason with them. And he calls them to stand firm because he knows that the Lord is near. Before we get into the how of the new reality, I want to address the what of the new reality. Let's look at what Paul writes just before the hinge verse. He says, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body, by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. So, I want to set the scene a little bit and and share what I think is uh, an example of Paul showing exactly what this citizenship of heaven means and how he models it. Uh, This this story comes from Acts 16. Let's remember that Paul arrived in the city after seeing a vision of a man of Macedonia. And on arriving, he and his companions with him find a group of women praying by the river, one of whom... Lydia goes on to become the first convert in Philippi and a host of the first house church in that city. Sometime later, Paul rescues a slave girl from a spirit of divination, uh, which apparently financially ruins the owners of this girl. So the owners, they grab Paul and Silas, who was with him, and they drag him through the marketplace to the city rulers called magistrates. And we are going to pick up the story there. So Acts 16, verses 20 to 24, read, And when they had brought Paul and Silas to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews, and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us, as Romans, to accept or to practice. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore their garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. I don't know about you, but I don't imagine, uh, I don't imagine myself reacting well, responding well to these circumstances. Look at all, all that happens to them. They, they're, they're attacked, they're stripped, They're stripped naked, they're beaten with rods, they're thrown into prison, into the inner prison, and have their feet fastened in the stocks. I I just, it would be so easy to be self-righteous and to what, to be what we would call in a human sense, justifiably angry. And now add to this that Paul himself actually has special rights as a Roman citizen in this case. 
And as a citizen, he is entitled to plead his case. He's entitled to a trial. And according to some commentators, beating a Roman citizen without such a trial was nearly as, as severe a crime as murder. So what they've done to you is not only obviously morally wrong, it not only tramples on your rights, it is blatantly illegal. So what do you do? I've never had anything remotely like this happen to me. But when I have been wronged, I admit that I do not always respond. I don't always respond the way that we're going to see that Paul does here. Um, there have been times when I've responded with bitterness or held grudges or I have pleaded my case. And I say that to my shame. And I would ask that all of us consider how we've responded to, uh, to wrongs, uh, both real and perceived, um, and to especially consider how we respond publicly. It's so easy now. To, to experience something that we don't like and to, um, to it's so easy to, to post these things on, on social media, to, re, to react and to respond to them. And, you know, that stuff is it's out there and it's public and everyone sees it. And I know that these have been trying and difficult times um, I know that, but I, I also know that the way that we respond as Christ followers, the way that we respond as believers determines, it, help, it helps to determine how the unbelieving world perceives Jesus Christ, not just us. So I want to consider for a minute how Paul responds to this and, what, and, and how he calls us to imitate him. Starting at verse 25, it says about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bonds were unfastened. And when the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, do not harm yourself for we are all here. We are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Um, bear with me because I'm going to mix metaphors a little bit. I, Yesterday I was working on this message and uh, Courtney told me that we were like 15 minutes away from the SpaceX uh, shuttle liftoff. And so I went down and watched that with my family and a little while after liftoff, um, after they've cleared the atmosphere uh, and after the stage one rocket has landed back on the drone ship platform, which was incredible, um, there's a NASA commentator that starts speaking and he says something like, it's incredible what we can do when we work together and put our minds to it. He said, American engineering designed American rockets on American soil carrying American astronauts into the cosmos. And it was a little bit surreal to sit there and watch this happen, especially against the, the backdrop of coronavirus and the backdrop of civil unrest And, and I thought, you know, we're, we're sending these, these people into space uh, and some have a dream of eventually colonizing the moon or Mars or some other body in the cosmos. And it's understandably inspiring. Um, and what would, they, what would they think if they knew that the king of the cosmos had already come down to them? that he's come down to us and he has established a colony here. That we're that colony. And we're here to stand firm in that reality, bearing his image until he returns to 
fully restore the kingdom. And that seems to me to be Paul's mindset. He is so convinced in his mind of the reality of the kingdom and the reality of Jesus Christ and his life and death and resurrection that his response to being so deeply wronged is to worship. His response is to rejoice. His response is the one that recognizes that the Lord is at hand. This is what Paul means when he talks about, let your reasonableness be made known to all men. This, this is, Paul's response is his version of reasonableness. And so we get to see also how the world responds to a man who worships God and rejoices when these terrible wrongs happen to him. We can see that, like, uh, Acts, the next, the next little bit of this passage will record um, the salvation of the jailer and of his whole household, and we rejoice in that. But I also want to look at, look at what happens with the prisoners. It says that the rest of the prisoners were listening to Paul and Silas worshiping God. And then when the earthquake comes, it, it opens all of their doors and it looses all of their bonds. But it's not just Paul and Silas who are there when the jailer wakes and um, realizes what's happened. It says, pa Paul says to him, we're, we're all here. This, this is the power of the good news that Paul believes in. It kept him from, from bitterness and it allowed him to rejoice in circumstances that were awful. He couldn't help but rejoice. He couldn't help but worship. And in rejoicing, the world around him couldn't help but take notice. It says his, the fellow prisoners listened to him. We should all, <laughs> I know that I, I, there, there's a lot I would do to have people uh, listen in the way that these prisoners listen to Paul. Their earthly freedom is right there before them. And they stay to hear these, these men speak about a, a citizenship of heaven that they've never heard of but is available to them. In rejoicing, even... Even Paul's enemy is saved here. The jailer who begins as an oppressor um, and all his family gain eternal life. And so this is what Paul is talking about when he turns the page on that hinge verse and uh, goes into chapter four of Philippians. And so we're going to start with verse four. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the, and the God of peace will be with you. Amen. In the coming days and weeks um, and months and, and years, all our lives, we're going to face challenges both old and new as a society and as a church. We're faced right now with this novel coronavirus pandemic. And at the same time, we are seeing uh, flare up these old, long entrenched inequalities that are too easy to ignore until they boil over as they have in the wake of the death of George Floyd. 
And in the future, who knows what will come, but there will certainly continue to be trials. And we can expect probably that, that our, our beliefs in Jesus Christ will eventually become um, minority enough and offensive enough to create real persecution for us. And how are we going to react to all of these things, past, present, and, and future trials? For the sake of the gospel and for the sake of our testimony in the world, we can't ignore them. And as we've seen by Paul's example, which he tells us to, which he tells us to practice, we should not stand on the rights granted to us by human societies and by human constitutions. And so I, I hope that whatever comes, whatever trials, whatever, whatever oppression, whatever uh, loss of rights, I hope that we won't fight back on the ground of, of our rights as citizens of this country or of any earthly country. Because what would it say to the world to see a church that together responds with joy in the face of various trials? What would it say to the world and how would they respond to a church that addresses societal grievances while pointing to the promises and hope that they have in God rather than what they have in man? Who might be compelled to believe in Jesus, who we love, if when the church is eventually persecuted, we respond with worship, with rejoicing, with a heavenly reasonableness instead of fear or anger or even resistance. I want to talk for just a, a minute or two longer about reasonableness uh, before we wrap up. There was a, a time while I was preparing for this message that uh, that was definitely what this message was going to be about. Um, I was so struck by that verse. It's sandwiched between two very memorable, very popular, and very encouraging verses. Uh, it's sandwiched right in between. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. And do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And so many people know and love uh, those verses, and rightly so. But there's this, this verse here in between um, that seems so unassuming and, and quaint at first. But right now, I, I think it's the verse of our times. Let your reasonableness be made known to all men. The Lord is at hand. I, I'm not sure what we could use right now more than reasonableness. Uh, and just to consider the word um, and the way that it's used, uh, it's also sometimes translated as gentleness uh, with the sense of a benevolent ruler or even translated as yielding with the sense of giving up your own rights for the benefit of another. And I think those are both valid alternative translations. Um, but when you read it, I, I've come to think all three of those words, uh, reasonableness, gentleness, yielding, um, all rolled into one. In this one word, we're called to reason with our minds, to be gentle in our spirits, and to be yielding with our lives. How different the world would look if we, if we took that to heart. Be reasonable. Make sure everyone knows just how reasonable you are, Paul says. How far you're willing to go for the sake of all men. And he, he's saying you can do it because the Lord is at hand. Which here means that he's near to strengthen and to protect you. And that also we will be with him soon, face to face. One way or another. And no matter what it is that we are up against, 
we can bear it for a little while. So be reasonable. The pilgrims aboard the Mayflower, they knew that in order for their mission and for their colony to be successful, they needed to be united. So they wrote that contract that we read earlier that would remind them of their purpose and unite them when things got hard and protect them from losing themselves to the world around them. So before they got off that ship, before they stretched their legs on land again, they wrote the document that we read earlier. And below that document were the signatures of every eligible person aboard that ship. And it helped them define a new normal in a new world. And we sit here now 400 years later with the same opportunity. We are all at anchor off the coast today, itching to get off the ship and back to land, itching to get back to normal. But let's remember that our old normal wasn't perfect. Sometimes it wasn't even great. Let's be reasonable together in the way that Paul understood it. We have a chance to create the world anew all over again. Let's do it with rejoicing. Let's do it with the reasonableness of heaven. Let's remember that the Lord is at hand. So I'm going to put our text um, from today into the chat, and then I'm going to pray um, and hand it over for, uh, for a song at the end. And in the chat box, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask that you consider typing your name or your family name in response. It's not a requirement and it's no covenant, but I hope it's an encouragement and a guide to all of us as we go about establishing a new normal in a new post-coronavirus world. Remembering that we, like the Philippians, are a colony of heaven with all the rights and blessings its citizenship offers. Give me just a second as I actually figure out how to do that. I may not have thought this through. I seem to have exceeded some kind of character limit. <laughs> Give me a second. I see it, Kyle. <laughs> Good. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before you just so grateful of who we are in you and of the citizenship and promises and blessings and, and rights that we have in your kingdom. We pray that that would be so evident to the world that our joy and trust and faith in our heavenly citizenship would, would just be so appealing to those who, who don't have that yet, who don't know you and your son. Lord, we pray for, um, for your kingdom on earth, that it would um, find its way into the hearts of people all over the world, that it would spread and that it would, um, it would rejoice in the knowledge that you are coming again soon, that you are near and at hand, and that one day we'll be face to face together with you for all eternity. We love you and we thank you and we praise you. Um, we pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs>